I'm Larry Flatt, and I'm speaking freely. What this is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great? It's an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Welcome to Speaking Freely. I'm Ken Paulson. Our guest today is Larry Flint, a self-described pornographer, pundit, and now an author of a new book called Sex, Lies, and Politics, The Naked Truth. Welcome to Speaking Freely. Thank you. Glad to be here. You uh, have some familiarity with First Amendment issues. Uh, this whole show is about free expression. I'm not sure there's anybody whose name is on as many pivotal First Amendment cases as, as you. Uh, well, I, I seem to have uh, got in roast and uh, this battle for free speech uh, 30 years ago. You know, I think I had to stand in a courtroom and listen to a judge sentence me to uh, 25 years in prison before I realized it was something that could no longer be taken for granted. And, uh, you know, the fight's been going on since then. Uh, we won some and we lost some. Of course, the big one was when you took on Jerry Falwell. And that stems from uh, a satirical ad in Hustler magazine, which was a, a, a parody on a, an ad campaign called The First Time. And this, basically this ad suggests that Jerry Falwell, leader of the moral majority, a, a, a religious leader, had his first sexual experience with his mother in an outhouse. And, uh, and this is what you brought to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Falwell sued you, and, uh, and at the lower court, uh, he actually won in a very strange way, not for libel, because no one could believe that, that there's any truth to it, but because you were, in effect, mean to him, intentional infliction of emotional distress. They wanted me to pay uh, Reverend Falwell $200,000 because I hurt his feelings. My attorney says, pay it, because he was suing it for $50 million. He said, it'll cost you $2 million to take it to the Supreme Court. I said, well, that's where we're going. And we lost in the Fourth Circuit. It wasn't looking very good then. And no one thought that the Supreme Court would ever grant cert. And they did. And their decision was unanimous. Uh, I remember uh, Justice Rehnquist's words um, even so clearly today, he said simply because uh, the government finds speech uh, offensive does not give them the right to repress it. Right. And so pivotal that if they, if they reached a contrary ruling that said if you deeply offend or, or inflict uh, emotional harm on public figures, then what happens to the press? Well, what happens to the press is that means no public figure would ever have to prove liable. All he would have to do is go into court and prove you hurt his feelings, whether it's a political cartoonist or an editorial writer or what have you. you know, the press would have been virtually doomed, and I don't think it was the, the Supreme Court siding uh, with me over Reverend Farwell. I think that they were looking at the practical implications of uh, the decision if they would have ruled the other way. Of course, that case is a big part of a very popular uh, movie that uh, started uh, Woody Harrelson playing you and the People versus Larry Flint. You know, I get letters all the time from uh, law school professors who say the movie is required viewing and that they teach that course in First Amendment law in all the law schools. Uh, it, it's unbelievable because other than going back to 64 when uh, prayer was taken out of public school with the suit by Madeline Mary O'Hare, there had not been a major First Amendment decision, other than uh, other than Sul uh, Sullivan versus New York Times, I guess you could say, back in that same period. So we went almost a half a century without a major First Amendment uh, decision. You know, it's interesting looking at the way people have written about you, the way people talk about you, and you certainly have been a controversial publisher and pornographer. 
but there almost seems to be a dramatic difference in your public life or perception of you as a public man, pre-movie and post-movie, that there is much more sympathy and much more support and much more understanding, I think, of you after the movie. Have you? <laughs> is that true? I started to notice that after the movie and after my autobiography come out, but when I really noticed it was when I got involved in the impeachment fiasco and exposed Congressman Livingston and Barr and a bunch of those hypocrites just to let the people know who was trying Clinton that hypocrisy crossed party line. Let's talk, let's talk about that. That's a big and, part of your new book. I have had literally thousands of people come up to me, and they're little old ladies in their 70s and 80s, and they'll grab me by the hand and squeeze my hand and say, I just want to thank you for what you did for the president. You know? Really? And that's been the most gratifying. Well, what you did was offer a $1 million reward to people who would come forward and, ex and reveal that they had had a, a illicit relationships, sexual relationships with ex congressmen and women, presumably, or senators, and or anybody in the administration, right? Yeah. What were you trying to accomplish with that? Way back in 76, when uh, Wilbur Mills and Wayne Hayes, two very famous congressmen, one on the House Ways and Means Committee, and uh, they were involved in sex scandals in Washington. And we were trying to get information there then, and I couldn't, nobody was getting any for it, and I, so I wanted to run an ad in the Washington Post, and Ben Bradley turned it down, and I asked a friend of mine who worked at the Post to talk to him and see if he would reconsider you know, I don't want nothing to do with Larry Flynn. So I wrote directly to Catherine Graham, and I said, how could you? as the publisher of a newspaper that epitomizes what the First Amendment is all about. You published uh, not only Watergate, but the Pentagon Papers. You brought down a president, and now you want to turn down an ad that is clearly First Amendment. I just don't understand your rationale. I got a handwritten note back from her, which I have framed now. He said, Mr. Flint, please resubmit your ad. Wow. So when I run this last ad on the Clinton impeachment, my attorney, everybody around me said, hey, the Times won't take that ad, the LA Times won't take it, and the Washington Post won't take that ad. And I said, you guys might be surprised. And I didn't tell them what I was banking on. But I was banking on that there were still some people working at the Washington Post that were there when Catherine Graham said, run his ad. And, and, did, and, 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 they, were, and they were. They were there. So the ad sale right through for insertion on the Sunday edition. So your point was that there are a lot of people in high places that have secrets they want to keep, and that it's not, it's not strictly one party or the other. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting, though, to me about your whole, your whole approach. People who admire you, absolutely admire you for your strong stance on the First Amendment, but then go through your, your history and you go, well, we understand the point, but you sort of crushed a couple people's career in the process here. Was that a good thing to do? Well, I think any time you take a public position contrary to the way you live your private life, you deserve the worst. Because hypocrisy is the biggest threat that democracy has. And that's the problem in Washington. You know? It's one big hornet's nest of, of hypocrisy. Well, you have always published what you believed through, in your magazine, and, and that has always attracted, you know, lightning bolts and criticism. A couple of moments in the history of Hustler, which, you know, was more explicit than most mainstream magazines of the day, and you persevered, and you discovered there was a, an appetite for the kind of content you had. Early on, you had a huge financial success by publishing photographs of Jackie Onassis um, in the nude, 
someone had taken with a long-range telephoto lens that others in this country wouldn't publish. Um, fast forward to very recently, you are offered an opportunity to publish what purportedly are some compromising photos of Jessica Lynch, and you choose not to. Is that because you felt that what you did to Jackie Onassis wasn't right? No. Uh, Jacqueline Onassis, public figure, former first lady, she was an icon. And that's what people were buying the magazine for. Not to see her in the news, but to see the icon in the news. Yeah, this was a whole different person, purpose than Jessica Lynch. You know, Jessica Lynch uh, was used as a pawn for the administration to sell their war in Iraq. Uh, sort of a modern-day Joan of Arc, I guess you would say. We found out all those stories were not true. All of her injuries occurred as a result of her army turning over, and she never emptied her clip, but the enemy has said. It jammed, and not a single round was ever fired. You know, she was finally taken to the hospital. Even her captors made an attempt, you know, to give her back to the U.S. government. And to her credit, she has told us all this in her own way and never pretended to be a hero. Uh, true. But the reason why I didn't publish the nude photographs I had of her was she had not claimed to be anybody other than what she was, you know. And uh, she was just simply being exploited uh, by the military. Her sexual activity, you know, had nothing to do with, uh, with her involvement in the war. You know, I mean, uh, there was no correlation. And yet you, you know. bought the photographs? Yeah. To secure them? Bought them, got them in my safe. I told her if she ever wanted them, she could call me and I'd send them to her, but she never called, so. You know, a lot of, at the time of the movie, and, I, and of course you're showing great respect for a woman there, but you've rarely been accused of showing a lot of respect for women. Your critics, Gloria Steinem and others, have always been critical, and particularly the, the notorious cover in which a woman is shown with a meat grinder. Uh, and that's come back to haunt you over and over again. Is that a misunderstanding, or what, what exactly were you thinking when you put that in the cover of your magazine? That was pure satire, nothing else. It sure wasn't put there to turn anybody on. But the, and part of the reason why I did it was because of the relentless attacks by the feminists. Uh, you know, their only claim to fame is to urge a bunch of ugly women to march. <laughs> and their dialogue hasn't changed in the last 30 years. Now, I, don't get me wrong, I'm for women's rights, equal, equal rights in the workplace, equal pay, non-discrimination. But I just don't feel that the feminists that are on the fringe speak for the average woman in America today. You are perhaps the nation's foremost expert on that line where something becomes obscene. I mean, for viewers at home, and, and you know, a lot of people miss this. Pornography is protected by the First Amendment. Pornography is erotic content for adults. It's protected unless it crosses that line into something called obscenity, a legal definition that, that uh, you know, involves prurient interest uh, and, and, and certainly involves community standards. And you, you started Hustler in a community that they had pretty conservative standards, Cincinnati, uh, which is why in 77 you said the first time you were sentenced to jail. Uh, how do you, as a pornographer, Stay out of jail. How do you how do you determine where that line is? What society will permit, and and what can lead to somebody being jailed? Because what most prosecutors, both federal and state, fail to realize is they're not the community, 
And the community is very contrary when it comes to having the government of the state to tell them what they can read or see in the privacy of their own home. My attorney tried a case down in St. Louis, Missouri. Twelve jurors, all female, average age of 60, had some really rough stuff. After viewing all the films, they come back in two hours and quit it. And when they talked to these jurors later, they just said, it's not my cup of tea, but I don't want to be telling my neighbor, you know, what he can view or, or see. So I, I think that's where the morality police sort of miss it at. You know, they can have all the fantasies they want to about prosecuting an obscenity case, but if they can't get the consensus of 12 jurors, nothing's going to happen. Basically, we don't know what community standards are anymore, do we? Because people can download yeah. in the privacy of their bedroom. And yeah. Well, you see, another thing, when the Supreme Court made that decision in 1973, it was Miller versus California. You didn't have the Internet then. So now uh, the Internet can be introduced as evidence in terms of defining community standards. So, so there are all kinds of garbage on the Internet. So it's going to be very, very tough, you know, to to get obscenity convictions. I'm not saying they can't. It's really going to be tough in most communities. You wonder at a time when there's a lot more talk about indecency on television, maybe the pendulum swinging back and those prosecutions will be more aggressive. Did you bring that issue up? It frightens the hell out of me because I think many of the civil rights and individual liberties that we gain in the last century with a very liberal Warren Court have been placed in jeopardy with this new conservative Supreme Court we've got and this new conservative administration. You make a number of points in your new book about about the Bush administration and about conservatives and, um, and you know, the cover is you pictured in front of an American flag and and I know you don't write a book without the intent of at least opening some minds, perhaps changing some minds, raising awareness. But in some ways, if you're, if you're in the Bush administration, aren't you the opponent they want? I mean, you described yourself as a smut peddler. Aren't, are they really worried about being criticized by somebody who's a pornographer and smut peddler? Aren't, aren't you almost their fantasy opponent? That see who's against us? A pornographer, the publisher of Hustler, a man who's run... Uh, topless bars. Well, you know, it's a heck of a lot easier to discredit me than it will be somebody like Bob Woodward. I'm not denying that. But I have a base of support, and it's not small. I feel I have to keep getting the message out there. I feel it's my obligation to continue to get the message out there. It's my duty, you know. So, uh, Whatever the Republicans are doing, you know, they can't do any more, any worse than what they've already done. And we just, you know, you, you're often self-deprecating. You, 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 when you ran for governorship of California, you described yourself as a, a smut peddler who cares. Um, you've run for president, um, and and you know, it's 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 an interesting life you lead in that you, I assume you have all the material needs you could ever ask for, um, and that you've got an empire, a very successful businessman, and, and yet you jump into the public fray over and over again. Um, I mean, for example, why did you run to be governor of California? Did you think there was a shot you could win? No, but once I seen uh, the condition the state was in, in terms of the deficit, I felt by announcing my candidacy, I would have an immediate platform to get out some suggestions that I wouldn't normally be able to that might help 
balance the budget and alleviate some of the state's financial problems. And the big idea I had was the state should exam should uh, expand gaming regulations and allow the private casinos to have slot machines. So they're going to pick up a couple billion dollars more in tax right there. Well, I used that platform quite effectively. I didn't have any visions about going to Sacramento. You know, I, ju I just wanted the press to look at me about the issues that I was talking about. Now, as a result of all this, we've got an initiative uh, on the ballot that will be voted, that the voters will be voting on in, uh, in November of this year, and we might be able to get it. You used a similar strategy in another battle that's outlined in your book, and it has to do with getting access to the battlefields in Afghanistan. You, you went to court to make the case that a reporter for Hustler should be allowed uh, to be present with the troops uh, to chronicle that war. A logical extension of the First Amendment, if you're a watchdog on government, you have to keep an eye on what government's troops are doing and report on that war. Um, and, uh, and, and although that case um, has not yet been resolved, um, I, I have to believe that your litigation had, had some influence on the Defense Department's decision to go ahead and, and allow embedding in Iraq. I think it did, especially because after the trial judge in uh, uh, Washington uh, made a ruling that we had a First Amendment right to, uh, to cover the war. I believe the Pentagon got a little nervous about that, even though he didn't, you know, uh, rule on our motion about access for, you know, total press. But it's important to see why I got to that point, and it wasn't just grandstanding. After the Vietnam War was over, see, like, the press ended the Vietnam War. That's what brought Walter Cronkite and other distinguished journalists brought that war to an end. Then when Reagan invaded Granada, a little island, the press didn't have a clue. They were nowhere around. And then later on, when Bush Sr., goes into Panama to get in Ariego, the press was nowhere around. And then when the Gulf War started, basically the only coverage that anybody can remember of that Gulf War is Peter Arnett standing on the rooftop of the hotel where he was staying and uh, uh, broadcasting uh, what he knew about the war. So I was very upset about this, as well as several other journalists. So when this happened in Afghanistan, and they were just sort of picking and choosing, and then they were not like when you would see those evening broadcasts where it would show pictures of these journalist positions and different geographical areas, you got the impression that they were covering a war in Afghanistan. But they may have been hundreds of miles away from what they were actually reporting on. They weren't getting to cover the war. So that's when I filed the suit and said, you know, this is ridiculous because if Franklin Roosevelt would have conducted World War II in this manner, we wouldn't even have a history channel today. <laughs> uh, and uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, our case is going to make it up to, uh, to the Supreme Court probably. Uh, we may win or we may not. He fought. First Amendment battles involving obscenity. Um, you fought a First Amendment battle, a pivotal one involving parody. And more recently, as you've just described, you fought this battle of access to battlefields and access to government information. You spent a lot of time thinking about free speech and freedom of the press in this country. 
just as a final question, what do you think it is that Americans misunderstanding about the First Amendment? Do they really embrace and understand the principles of the First Amendment? No. We were born into a nation where all of our freedoms are taken for granted. We already had our civil liberties and our civil rights. So that's why on college campuses there's nothing but apathy out there. No one is concerned. They think it's going to get, be with them forever. And they don't realize that you can lose these freedoms as easily as you can gain them. You know, when Hitler started, the top of his agenda was censorship. But he didn't start burning the classics. He started with the so-called garbage that nobody wanted to read. And eventually it led to Voltaire and Shakespeare. You know, and if we can't realize that it's possible for this to happen to us, we're, we're in really big trouble. Kids today, you know, they know a little bit about history, and they know a little bit about freedom, but they don't know how difficult it was. Thanks for joining us here today. Our guest today has been Larry Flint. His new book, Sex, Lies, and Politics, The Naked Truth, is out now. I'm Ken Paulson. Please join us again next week. Join us next week as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts.